Hello everyone, I'm Mariela Condorena. Thank you all for finding time and visiting today's webinar. Please remember to, jo uh, remember to join us in Facebook or maybe if you use WhatsApp, you can join us on WhatsApp too. Uh, you can subscribe on our channel in, on YouTube or you can visit uh, our Google site. Now uh, we have two new channels as Twitter and TikTok. Please join us, the art teachers. Uh, now, please uh, let me introduce some directions. Maybe Miss Pamela Salazar, can you help me, please? Of course, dear Miss. Thank you, Miss Mariela. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for being here with us. Well, now I'm going to give you some directions for this webinar. Please take them into account because they are very important. Uh, please type your questions in the comments section. You have there the comment section. So if you have any question, try to type them in this section, please, because these answers are going to be replied by our guest speaker at the end of the, web of the webinar in the question time section. When finishing the webinar, we will share a link for you to have access to the exit ticket, which will be available for 15 minutes. Well, please, Miss Sully, what about our speaker today? Can you introduce him, please? Of course. Thank you, Miss Pamela Salazar. Hello everyone, welcome to our second crash webinar in our community English teachers in Peru. It's a pleasure and honor for me to introduce our guest speaker for today's webinar. This is Leonardo Mercado. Leo is originally from Queens, New York. He has been in the educational field for more than 25 years. As a language program administrator, he has worked as an academic coordinator, academic branch manager, project manager, test center administrator, and director of studies. Over the year, uh, he has led large scale projects to create and implement the diverse e learning platforms, as well as several nationwide projects with Peru's Ministry of Education and other entities. His most notable accomplishments include a successful international accreditation process with the CEA, along with a successfully or a successful preliminary inspection with equals. He is now an entrepreneur who is holding his own professional consultancy firm in YZ Learning Solutions. As a speaker, he has presented at national and international conferences in the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and most of Latin America, including TESOL International, IATFL equals next TESOL and ABLA. As an author or co-author, he has numerous international publications. Leo also holds a master's degree in education with a specialization in curriculum and instruction from the University of Phoenix. In today's webinar, Mr. Mercado is going to offer us the presentation title, Fundamental Approaches and Methods for Communicative Language Teaching. Welcome, Mr. Mercado. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And the audience is all yours. Thank you so much, Sulamita. Thank you, English teachers in Peru. Thank you, Mariela Condarena and the entire team. It's a great pleasure to be here, of course. I'm very happy to be here. And uh, we have a lot to cover today. Uh, certainly, I will be talking about fundamental approaches and methods for communicative language teaching. And uh, so I think uh, hopefully uh, this session will be very uh, informative, but at the same time, very practical, very helpful for your teaching in the virtual classroom, as well as hopefully not too far from now, not too far along from now, 
in uh, our return to the physical classroom, right? So both the virtual and the physical classroom hopefully will be coming back very soon. Okay, so as soon as, there we go, there's the sharing option. And I will now uh, present, there we go. Let's move this along here and bingo. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see that. And I will move this over here. So welcome aboard, great to have you with us this afternoon. Uh, what we're gonna talk about is approaches and methods as they contribute to communicative language teaching. Uh, we're gonna move from the general conceptualization of everything that we do, the reasoning behind it and the why for our teaching decisions to application, connecting it to what we do in the uh, virtual and the physical classroom. And finally, we'll have some time to look at some exam prep examples because uh, we're going to talk to you at the very end about our MAS ELT program. Uh, so that I will talk about at the very, very end. But yeah, we have a lot to cover, a lot of work to cover. And we're going to start with an overview of approaches and methods because it's important to go back a little bit in history to understand where we are today and how we got here. Yeah? So if we look at history, uh, we look at uh, everything that's been going on for the longest time, uh, we have been trying to find the ideal way to teach uh, English, to get people to learn, to get people to learn quickly, to get people to learn successfully, to meet their needs, okay? And so we've been looking for uh, the El Dorado, so to speak, of teaching and learning. And that's why we've been uh, experimenting with different uh, methods and approaches over the decades and over the years. And so, you know, at any particular point in time, a method or approach was in vogue, it was popular, uh, people adhered to it. But then over time, which is natural in, in life, you know, you learn, you advance, you evolve, and you move on to new things as you learn these lessons. And so uh, eventually, we got to a point where we were not looking for uh, any, more any more particular methods or approaches, but we found ourselves in what is now called a post-methods era. And uh, so this, was this term was first coined by uh, Jack Richards and uh, Ted Rogers. Uh, and this was back in uh, the, the beginning of the 2000 uh, decade, specifically 1997. And what it basically means is that we don't really try to adhere to any specific approach anymore or any specific method. What we're doing is we're teaching based on principle, depending on the students that we're working with, their characteristics, their needs, and their expectations. So most of the approaches and methods that we've tried over the years and decades are still alive and well in some form or another. When we go to class, whether it's the virtual classroom or the physical classroom, they're still alive, but they're not fully blown as they used to be in the past. So we're gonna talk about teaching procedures. We're gonna talk about steps. We're gonna look at characteristics of different activities. I think this is very important. It's very important for us when we make decisions as we work with our students. And it's also very important in order to be able to take, for example, a variety of different standardized assessments for teachers. For example, in the public service, teachers who are in the public service who wish to be in public service have to take different examinations depending on whether they're trying to enter for the first time or if they are um, getting a promotion. So the you know, nombramiento, the ascenso, or if you're taking an international examination like the TKT, there are, it's very important to know what the standard procedures are for teaching and learning. And so we're gonna look at that and we're gonna look at the tenets that make it easy to identify the kinds of decisions and the kinds of actions we need to take in class, okay? Very good, so let's start off just to review a little bit. We're gonna look at our, uh, we're gonna kind of go back a little bit in time and try to remember our approaches and methods. And on the left, what you see is a list, beginning with project-based learning which is number one. Number two is task-based learning. Number three is the audiolingual method. Number four is CBL or CLIL, and I will clarify that a little later, uh, but I'm just gonna leave it at that to see if you can remember what they mean, what they stand for. Number five is the lexical approach. Number six is the 3P method. And number seven is problem-based learning. Now to the right, you're gonna see a description, okay? And so uh, try to match 
the approach and method or method on the left with the appropriate description on the right. See if you can match them. I'll give you a couple of minutes, maybe three minutes to see if we can kind of refresh our memories and uh, try to remember which is which. Remember all of these in one way or another are still alive and well in our classroom. So they still have relevance. Try to look and try to match what you see on the left to the right. I'll give you three minutes, okay? And I'm using my stopwatch right here, which is very important. Remember, time is very important. We never have enough of it. So time your activities so that you can stay on track and on with your timetable. Three minutes. And I see Teddy Quinones and Vicky and Katy Pachas, Rosemary de la Cruz. I, th I think I saw Maribel Delgado before. So I hope I'm not making too much noise. I'm just very excited to see all the people who are joining us. Magda Ramirez is saying hello, and Yanni Calderon also. Gles Nunez, very good. JT Orlando from Ancash, beautiful, fantastic. So don't mind me. I'm, you know, I get, I'm a, very, I'm a friendly guy. I like, I like seeing people. So, focus on the task. We've got about a minute, two minutes left, and then we'll see what how we proceed from here. Okay, Rosa Lenor, Lilia. All right, great to have you on board, Viviana. Viviana's, she's in 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 the up north in the in the hot areas like uh, maybe Loreto, Viviana, where are you? Loreto, Madre de Dios, where are you exactly? Beatriz Hidalgo, Luzmila, Maita, okay, good. Excellent. Okay, we have one minute and 30 seconds left. Let's see where we are. Let's see how much we can remember. And as you are trying to remember, if you can, when you type your name, when you're, you know, you're sending a message, try to type the number and the letter. So if you think number one is A, type one and A, and then we'll see if uh, we can match it to the list. And I want to check the chat box over here. Okay, they're telling me, I think, can everybody hear me? Yes, Leonardo. Okay, you can hear me. Okay, great. Okay, fine. Okay, we Gless, I think Gless Nunez, I think I know her. She's she's got she's started already. She's got her numbers right there. We got Meili Orozco from Vraim. Welcome, Meili. We got Joel de la Vega. He's on, he's on, he's working on there. He says number one is G and number two is C. Okay, very good. I see Rosana Alva. There we go. Hey, I, got, I can see some people I recognize over here. And of course, those of you who I don't, who I haven't met before, great to have you on board. Nice to meet you. Sulita is 4D, so four, she says 4D. Uh-huh, all right, we got some good answers out there. Oriel got everything done, look at that. Oh my goodness, look at that. She, she got everything over there. She's got the whole list. She says number one is C, 2G, 3E, 4D, 5B, 6A, and 7F. Okay, well, let's take a look. Good, we, everybody's giving it a shot. I'm glad to see. So G is project-based. Uh, uh, excuse me, project base is G. We're going to go a little more in depth into this, so don't worry about it. C is number two, three is E, four is D, five is A, six is B, and seven is F. Okay, so this is like a little refresher, and it's a little kind of like get us warmed up a little bit to talk about the topic. Now, this may not be on the list that we just saw. This is a method or an approach that has to do with uh, ambience, you know, the environment. Uh, this gentleman obviously is not one of our students and hopefully he's not one of our teachers. He's a little too relaxed, but that's the idea, you know, making sure that our students feel comfortable, that the environment is adequate. Sometimes we may use music 
in the background. And we're focused on creating a positive state of mind. So which one do you think this is? And I, I'm going to wait a few seconds here. About, about, I'll give it about a minute. And, uh, and I know you guys on Facebook, you know, there's a slight delay. So I'm going to give you a little extra time. Don't worry about that. But what, which one do you think this is? Which method or approach do you think this might be? And if, if you need it, give you a hint. Remember, we're focusing on affect. So this is how people feel, okay? We're focusing on affect. And I see somebody's with us from Barranca. Very good. And Paramonga, look at this. This is fantastic. We got people from all over the country. Lovely. Sveta. She gave it up. She okay, Sveta, Juan. Okay, we got Juan and Sveta. They gave it a shot. I have wait five more seconds. Okay, we're getting a lot of good guesses here. Okay, we're getting a lot of good guesses. The correct answer is Suggestopedia. Now, Suggestopedia had its roots back in the seventies. That's when it really started taking hold. Uh, you know, people were putting it into practice. It still applies today. I mean, the principles are still valid today. We still have to try to create a positive, welcoming, embracing learning environment where our students feel comfortable, where we don't have to worry about the affective filter, which is the, the term that was coined by Krashen, blocking any of the learning. We need to make our students feel comfortable. And at times we might need music. Now, what do you guys think? How many of you use music in your classrooms? Do you use music in your classrooms at all? Does anybody use music in their classroom? I'm gonna wait for our friends from Facebook to, to get the, that part of the, of the question. Who uses music? Isabel Lanza, I recognize that name. Isabel uses music. Okay. Rosemary de la Cruz uses it. I recognize that name too. Okay. A lot of people use it. So music is good. Now I always get asked this question. Should we use music? Is it okay to use music? It is good to use music. But remember, depending on the age group and depending on uh, your setting, music is fine at specific moments in time. It depends on the, on the stage of the lesson. It depends on whether it's appropriate for a particular occasion whether it will help your students relax more uh, and also try to diversify the music. Make sure the music is based on your students' expectations, not yours. Now, listen, I'm not going to say how old I am, but I'm a guy who, uh, who, who used to listen to Sting, The Police, uh, The Cure. Yeah, I listen to modern music too, but I'm not going to play The Cure in my classroom because my students are not going to know, they're not going to have any idea what that is. And they're going to think it's a, it's a history lesson. So we have to make sure that we're going to play music. It caters to the tastes and preferences of all of our students. It's age appropriate and it's not too loud. Please don't play Metallica in your classrooms. Okay. I think we had a teacher once, you know, you know, I've been working in large institutes for, I had worked in large institutes for a long time. So don't play Metallica. Some guy played Metallica. Okay. And we had to talk to him and say, Hey, listen, Try not to play the, the heavy metal, okay? Heavy metal is, you can play it at home. Don't play it in your classroom. Okay, this number two is collaborative. It has multiple stages. Usually you put your students in groups and teams. Uh, most of the work is done outside. Now listen, uh, okay, well, before I make that point, equal participation. You want all of your students to participate equally. It's very important that everybody has an equal opportunity to participate because otherwise, one will do more work than the other. And then you have a final delivery of a product or an outcome. So listen, this is very important. I want you to look at the description and I want you to tell me what this is. Erasure, yes. Maria Pilar Ukuwaila, excellent. Erasure, great group. So I think, I think we, we're talking about the same type of music. So which one do you think this is? now? Uh, my, my recommendation to you with all the exams and tests that exist out there, always look for keywords, look for hints, look for clues in the descriptions, whatever it might be. We're going to look at some test items later, but look at, look at keywords here. Here's something that's going to tell you what this is. Isabel, well, Isabel, she's in our Masi LT program, so she would probably 
get this really well. And Lopic is sharing with us that Suggestive is very effective. But what do you guys, okay, Suita, Sulita, excuse me, Carmen. Janelle, is, she's got a good guess right there. janelle has got a good guess. Okay, she said, she, is it task-based learning? She's asking. Now, remember, sometimes it might look very similar to another method or approach. So you have to look for the keywords. The keyword here is work outside of class. That means that we're talking about project-based learning. Okay, and project-based learning is still, still valid. We still work with projects. And I'll tell you very quickly, yes, Sophia, uh, PBL. Uh, I worked at an institute uh, many years ago. We used to have a break. We had used to have two-hour classes, and we had a break in between. And that was eliminated. We started working with block scheduling. And so a lot of the people were concerned. A lot of the people working the administration were concerned. They said, oh, well, how are we going to eliminate the break? That's when our students socialize. That's when they talk and they meet with each other. How can we do that? We can't do that. And I said, listen, don't worry about it. If, if the problem is socialization, then we can get them to socialize another way, make friends another way. So when I became director, we, we made the project a very important component of the evaluation, the assessment system for our students. So we worked with millions of students, millions of students over many, many years, and we got them to work with projects. That was an official grade. So that's, a, that's an excuse to get people to come together, to work together, get to know each other and become friends. How about this one? Number three, class activity, a lot of creating, a lot of creative juices flowing through the brain, collaborative again, working together, and you have a final outcome or a final product. What do you think that is? Yes, Ruth Cotrina, music is very important. Yes. Everybody else, Nan and J Jesse and uh, Katya and Charles got the PBL one right. What is this? What do you guys think this is? Uh -huh, Juan David. Juan David. Orieta. Good, good Orieta. So task-based learning, task-based learning actually came out in the 90s. And one of the pioneers, one of the advocates for task-based learning was Dr. David Noonan. Now, that's a name you should know. If you don't know it already, you should know it. He's one of the still one of the prominent figures in our field. And you know he's a, he's, he's a researcher, he's an author, he's a textbook writer, he's written many books. He has a world famous textbook for children uh, called Go For It. And back then it was created for Sengage Learning, Heinle and Heinle, excuse me, and then Heinle and Heinle became Sengage Learning. And um, you know, he sold 2 billion copies of his Go For It book. And he also had a textbook called Atlas. And I don't know if anybody remembers that textbook. It came out in the late 90s. It was ahead of its time. That's the term I think we need to use, ahead of its time. It was very focused on task-based teaching and learning, but nobody understood it back then. Nobody really appreciated what it was. And so it didn't really sell as well as this Go For It book. It really didn't sell that well. Not too many institutes adopted it, but today it would have been a great success because it's, it was an excellent book. It's just that it was ahead of its time. How about this one? American and British versions and I'm not talking about English, by the way. It's implicit, it's indirect. It's kind of an indirect approach to teaching the language or getting people to develop the language. Uh, there is a, a balance between subject matter and language focus. Uh, the instructor types might, mar might vary. In other words, you might have a person who teaches English or you might have a person who is not an English teacher uh, working, of, working with this. It can be very difficult to implement. Now, everybody talks about it. You know, we had a conference about two years ago in Peru. Everybody went to this conference. Everybody was in love with it. And everybody was talking about it. And everybody was saying, let's do it all over the country. And then they realized it wasn't that easy. It was easier said than done. So it can be complicated to implement because of several reasons that we're going to talk about. But I want to see who gets it right. Michael Navarro and Sofia Galindo and Miriam, okay, okay, Melly's got another guess, Rosana, Sveta again, because Sveta is very active today, Sulita also, okay, Juan David, he says content language integrated learning, okay, okay, we still, we got some people still, we got, we have some fans of TBL out there, they, they want to, they think there's also TBL, 
and Jesse thinks it's cool. So the correct answer is CLIL uh, or content-based instruction, sometimes called CBL, content-based learning, uh, CLIL, content and language integrated learning, and English medium instruction. So there are three. This is actually a, a, um, a spectrum here. Uh, so again, if we want to look at the difference, this is Brown and Bradford. And so we have kind of like the focus. I like the way they, they divide it up into focus on content and focus on language. So you have CBI more to the left, where the focus is more on language. Uh, Sometimes you, you hear CBI and CLIL used interchangeably. Uh, some people think it's CBL or CBI is a little more like an American version of CLIL. CLIL came later, by the way. I have to point that out. But CBI would be a little more focused on the language. So the language, the content is just an excuse to get people to, talk, to use a language and learn it. Okay. So what you're focused on in terms of the outcomes is the language and the performance in the language. Okay. And students are assessed on their ability to use the language, not the content. Now in the middle, CLIL, you have a balance. So there's a soft CLIL, which is a little more focused on language. It's really a dual balanced approach. Um, students are assessed on both language and content. And then you have, uh, you know, depending on the region, in some places, English teachers can teach CLIL courses. And in other places like in, um, Europe, you need content based or excuse me, content specialists. So the subject matter specialists to teach the courses. Okay. So for example, in Britain or Japan or South America, you'll find uh, English teachers teaching CLIL and uh, English medium instruction is really to the right. This is where the focus is on content. There are, there is no really, there's no focus on language assessment. There's no focus on language development. It's peripheral. If it comes, it comes. If it doesn't, it doesn't. So this is the spectrum, according to Brown and Bradford, which I think is very helpful to help you understand uh, the differences between CBI and CLIL, but also that English medium instruction, which is very important. By the way, in Peru, we have at least one, if not more, universities uh, working in the direction of EMI moving away. So that would be a hard CLIL to EMI. Uh, this has been happening for years. One particular university started using EMI quite a few years ago. I would say about almost 10 years ago, eight years ago, I think, I guess it was. It's not that easy because you have to find the right teachers. The teachers have to have the right level of English. So if you're going to teach finance, if you're going to teach economics, if you're going to teach uh, um, what have you, uh, physics, engineering courses, your English has to be very, very, very high. The problem is if your English is low and your students is, are higher than you, that's a problem. So English medium instruction and CLIL in general, CBI is not easy. It's not easy at all. It's easier said than done. Hopefully one day we'll get to that point. Okay, how about this one over here? Not really an approach. It focuses on teaching chunks. Uh, go Teresa. So yeah, CLIL in, in some schools is very popular. Uh, at the school level, we've seen it. We, we can see it applied successfully. It depends. Okay. Hello, Edia from Mexico. Good to have you here. Okay. So what about this? Not really an approach. It's focusing on chunks of language. Grammar is not important. Grammar is not the focus here because the person who created this method or approach doesn't believe grammar is important. He believes that we can get by uh, without grammar because this is the essence of language learning, whatever this is. And you teach it naturally and it's always meaning focused. So again, if, you're not, if you don't think grammar is important uh, and you're focusing mainly on just communication with whatever this is, then, then yeah, it's gonna be more meaning focused. So let's see. Okay, we're getting some glasses, functional, lexical, lexical. Okay, we got a lot of people on lexical and it is the lexical approach. And this was created by uh, Michael Lewis. Uh, Michael Lewis created this back in the 90s, mid 90s, mid to late 90s. And Michael Lewis talked a lot about this. Um, Michael Lewis, uh, I tried to bring Michael Lewis to Peru um, when I was working at an institute, a particular institute, we had a budget to bring famous ELT people. And I tried to bring Michael Lewis, but they told me, listen, if, 
if Peru doesn't have an opera house, then forget it because he, he won't go anywhere unless there's an opera house. He listens to opera, he loves opera, and that's the only place. He'll only go to places that have opera houses. So back then, Peru didn't have an opera house. Today has a beautiful opera house, but it didn't have one back then. So I desisted from inviting Michael Lewis. But um, he's right in a way. Perhaps it's, it's a little too much to say that the, you know, everything is just through vocabulary. Uh, it's almost like crash and also saying that input is is the only thing that matters and output doesn't. I mean, those are kind of extreme positions and it's never good to have an extreme position. It's always to have be somewhere in the middle. So yes, language is a very important. Vocabulary is very important. Lexus is very important. Lexus is learned in chunks in a natural setting, but that can't be the only focus of our teaching and learning process, okay? This one, uh, this is form focus, stages of a lesson, very safe, still used today, very conventional, um, introduces, familiarizes, and consolidates what we've, what we've learned. It's still probably number one, everybody still uses this, uh, even though it was created many, many years ago. What might this be? Let's see what guesses we got over here. So again, what do you guys think this might be? This is form focused. And we're gonna, we're gonna see this later, you know, what form focus means. Good, okay, so. PPP, the 3P method, yeah? Presentation, practice, and production is still used today, very safe. Not exclusively though, because now when you're teaching grammar, it, the 3P method is no longer enough. Most modern textbooks don't just focus on the 3P method. When we were teaching grammar back in the 90s, 3P method was really the only way we did it. Today, it's you can't really just stick to the 3P method, although it's good to know it, it's safe. Uh, standard procedure, very low risk, but also very traditional. And, and it can take a long, it might take too long. If you're not careful, it takes too much of your time. So yeah, 3P method. This one is old, but it's still around in one way or another. Uh, it's focused on accuracy, for, form focus, very little personalization. Don't find personalization over here. You're not gonna get it. Don't expect personalization. A lot of error correction. Now, if you notice all of these methods and approaches, we do all of these things today, all together, right? A lot of these things we do together. So error correction, very important here. By the way, error, we don't call it error correction anymore. We call it uh, corrective feedback because error correction is negative in, in, in connotation. So nobody really uses the word error correction anymore, unless you're a researcher who doesn't care about how students feel or teachers feel. Um, researchers are a little cold in that sense. But um, so what do you guys think this is? Juan David, Juan David, he's right on top of things. He's, he's all right, he's connected today. And Rosana Alba, I know that name. Yeah, Rosana is on there. And Sari, Sari, of course, Sari. I can see that Colombian flag. Sari is with us in the Maciel T as well. Okay, so Fia got Alindo also, Teresa Gutierrez. So yes, the audio, the audio lingual, the audio lingual method. Uh, um, so the thing with the audio lingual method, if, if, you know, we worked, when I arrived, when I started working at, uh, I remember I started working at Ibn back in 1997. I started as a teacher within three months, I was promoted to a supervisor. And I remember we, I went to the back, one of the, one of the, the, the back of the storage rooms, and they had a lot of books there. It was called the book room. I think it was called the book room. We called it the book room. And I found a lot of old books. And there were a lot of white, there, there was a white textbook that they used at Ipton for many, many years before they used interchange. So this was like up to 1990, 1991. And I said, what is this book? I went around asking people, what is this book? And they said, well, it's, it's the Mexican series. I was like, Mexican series? What do you mean the Mexican series? So the Mexican series was printed in Mexico and it was exported to Lima. It was exported to Peru because all of the all of back then all of the places were called Ibna. So they all used the Mexican series. And it was an audio lingual book. It was very traditional, no pictures, little or no pictures, drawings, 
very bland, very plain, very boring looking paper that looked like newspaper uh, or cardboard paper, excuse me. Uh, these dialogues that people had to memorize. It was a very, very boring, very impersonal, very distant uh, in terms of no connection. That was a problem with the audio lingual, but we still do audio lingual stuff. So we're still doing choral repetition. We're still doing corrective feedback. We're still doing transformation drills at times when we need to. Okay, when we're trying to check for top down, we're doing top down, bottom up processing and those things. How about this one? This is a little different. You're probably not gonna get this one. This is not very well used. This is not used very commonly. Uh, you can use it for speaking and writing. First, the students experiment. And this is usually better with when they have seen something. So they're kind of reviewing something and they're, they're going back to it. So they've seen it, they're going back to it. And uh, so they're experimenting with it. Yeah. And, uh, and then the teacher monitors, takes notes. And then after they, they're finished experimenting, you know, openly focused on meeting, they do, the teacher does a presentation or a clarification and gives feedback based on what she or he heard during the, um, the circulation and the monitoring, yeah? And so there's a second task, very similar to the first, where they get to practice again, but this time more accurate, more fluent, much better. So what do you think? Lena, okay, Lena Ascon and Joseline, and we're getting a lot of guesses here. Oh, we're gonna, see, we're getting a lot of variety now. We got task-based, we got teach, excuse me, test, teach, test. We've got TBL, we've got audio lingual, we've got problem-based learning, 3T, Jesse, okay, 3T, 3T, good. Task-based, grammar-based, okay. Okay, Lake Titica, Wilson, all right, Wilson. I just saw Wilson before that, yeah. Great guy, Wilson's a great guy, smart and great. Good to have you here, Wilson. And then Viviana, Suggestopedia. Okay, so it is teach, excuse me, test, teach, test. This is a little misleading, maybe because there is no real test. There, there really isn't a test. What we're doing is we're, we're, we're experimenting. I guess it should be called experiment, teach, experiment, or experiment, teach, try again. But that wouldn't sound too good. It would be like ETT. So I guess TTT would be better, uh, easier to remember. So this is when you want students to kind of review something they've seen before. Uh, they, you know, they, 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 they've learned something in the past and now you want them to put it to the test. You want them to try it out, see what they can do with it. And then you kind of refresh your memory. Yeah. So yes, yes, Gless, yes, Maddie, yes, Luz. Uh, it is TTT, but this is, a, this, is a, this is how we work with our students. This is not the TTT where we go like this, right? And I got this mixed up, CLT. See, I should have put this first. Oh, okay, so now we know <laughs> CLT, which is the focus today, information gap. There has to be an information gap. So when you see information gap or anything that resembles information gap, why am I going through all of this stuff? Because you're going to see this stuff on a test. You're going to see whether it's a TKT or a ministry test, you're going to see this stuff in one way or another. So you need to know this, yeah? So information gap means I know something you don't know, that you want to know. And you know something that I don't know that I want to know. So there's an information gap. We need to communicate to be able to close the gap. And usually when it's speaking, you have two or more students speaking to each other. And you, in, the, in, the, in the writing, when you're writing, there's, you're, you're writing to an audience. So this is very important. You're writing to an audience. And, uh, and comprehensibility is also the focus. You want to have maximize comprehensibility. Many years ago, we used to say, Isabel Hernandez, nice to see you from Mexico. Very good to have you on board. Many years ago, uh, we used to have, you know, when I was in, I did Michigan test. I was in charge of the Michigan test for a while nationwide. When, when the Michigan test was centralized in Lima, I was in charge of the Michigan test. And when you looked at the, at the descriptors for the oral test, uh, if you wanted to get a higher level for the test, you needed to speak like a native speaker. So it said native speaker. Uh, but hey, Maria Valverde, hello. And so, um, but they eliminated that because today the modern version, the modern definition of fluency, the modern definition of speaking competency uh, focuses on comprehensibility. Okay, fluency is comprehensibility. If you look at Dr. Michael McCarthy, he's the author of the 
uh, the book, uh, the, the Cambridge University book, Touchstone, and he's also a corpus linguist. And he talks a lot about uh, fluency, modern day fluency, which is active listener, comprehensibility, two working together in a conversation and so on. The focus is comprehensible. You, nobody wants you to sound like a native speaker anymore. That, that's, that's old. Nobody, nobody does that anymore, okay? Okay. Let's look at this. This is from a TKT, a past TKT test. And I would very much like, oh, that's right. I'm not using click meeting. I'm using Zoom, so I can't use my, my drawing tools. So that's okay, no problem. So I'll, I'll just work with this. So listen, we have testing approaches. Test, teach, test. Presentation, practice, production, 3P. Task-based learning. Now let's take a look over here. Learner's preferences. We're gonna match the learner's preference to the testing, uh, teaching approach. Let's look at 56. Real beginners who prefer a structural approach and like to have a clear focus on new language. Now we have some, I'm gonna give you some hints. We have some keywords here or key phrases. New language, real beginners, okay? Structural. Always look for key words and that will help you find the right answer, okay? So which one is it? A, B, or C? Okay, Michael and Carmen, they went ahead and they gave, gave it a guess. Evie, thank you for coming. Good. So yes, 56 is B because you're presenting something for the first time. So usually with the 3P method, it's very explicit. It's not implicit, it's explicit. And you're saying, hello, everybody. We're going to learn. Today, we're going to learn the present perfect. Okay, take out your notebooks. Let's, let's write down the formula. And then I'm going to give you some examples. So that's the traditional approach to teaching. Yeah? So I like, I'm going to give you, uh, let's see, I'm going to give you two minutes because you guys look really, really smart. We're going to give you two minutes. And then I'd like you to go over and do 57, 58, 59, 60, and 61. Okay. So this is like to warm us up a little bit, an easy task. Let's do this. And then we're going to get into the nitty gritty. We need to observe a class. We're going to do a lot of stuff later on. Okay. So write the number and then the letter good good loose loose has the right idea loose romero has the right idea he writes the number and then the letter Good, we're getting a lot of answers. Okay, 57. Hmm, that's interesting, okay. All right, we're getting answers for all of them. Very different answers. Interesting, 58, okay. Look for keywords. So just want to communicate. Meaning here, like to study grammar, lexical patterns, check what they already know. Learners at a higher level, but have already studied the structures, have already studied. So you have to look for keywords, key phrases. 
extended pieces of work, extended piece of work, such as project work. You have to remember what projects are all about. Okay, good. We're getting a lot of different answers. That's good because that means we have, uh, we have different opinions. Fantastic. And learners who are not confident about learning with, and who have little exposure, not confident, little exposure. Always look for key words. Always look for key terms. Okay, very good. Let's see. That's okay. If you didn't finish, that's okay. So here we go. Those learners just want to communicate using everything. So this is focused on entirely on meaning. Okay, just meaning, just getting out, talking, get your ideas out there. Uh, A, so again, what they already know, this is the key phrase. So here they're kind of reviewing, because remember that uh, test each test has a clarification presentation stage. Here, they have already studied the structures. So that means, again, review with this. Learners who enjoy extended pieces of work, project work. Project and task-based learning are, are very similar. Oops, what's that? Okay, so task-based is more general. It's an umbrella term, but if you're gonna copy it, if you're gonna going make a decision on what you're gonna see, you're gonna see task-based learning in the classroom, you're gonna see project work outside of class, but they're very similar to each other, so C. And then learners who are not confident about experimenting with language, who have very little exposure. So these are people who are very, who are, wanna see things for the first time, they wanna be slow and careful. That would be letter B, okay? So something else we have to do, and this is not only for the teaching decisions that we make, but it's also for tests. Believe me, you want to know what I'm going to tell you. Um, so when we're taking a test on teaching and learning, whether it be a ministry test or a, uh, uh, a TKT or some other test, you need to know the standard procedures, believe me. You need to know the standard procedure. Now, remember, teaching is a creative enterprise. It sh should be a creative enterprise. We don't want people just to do the same thing all the time. So we want to see variety, we want to see creativity, but there is a standard procedure, okay? You're never gonna see a lead in at the end. You're gonna see it at the beginning. You're never gonna see uh, a warm up in the middle of a class per se, unless you've had a break, but you, a warm-up has a specific purpose. And you're never gonna do exercises first if you haven't presented the language. So that there is a certain procedure and there are certain steps that we have to follow. Okay, so let's take a look at reading and listening. What do you think are the general steps to a, teach, a reading and listening lesson? So maybe you can write down Good, Sophia. Good. Very good. Sophia is another name I recognize. Sophia, Sophia, she's got, Sophia has got it right there. Reading and listening. So one, two, three, four, and five. What do you think we always do first? Okay, Sophia, good. Uh, Sophia, yeah. Okay, she's writing up there. Okay, Jocelyn, engaging students. Yes. Engaging students, but give guys, give me, give me a step, give me a, give me a number, and then give me. Um, that doesn't matter. Just give me the the steps. That's okay. If you have the number, you can put the number, and then what the teaching step is. Yeah. Okay. Let's do one more minute. Okay, Sari. Okay, Sari again. She's another one who's been uh, really paying attention. Ilda, good Ilda. Activate prior knowledge about the topic. Skim. Okay. All right. So we always have. A, usually, it's a discussion. We always have a. We have something to captivate the students' interest. It could be a brainstorming session, but we need to. We need an activity. We need to do a task or an activity that will engage the students with the topic of the reading or the listening. That always comes first, remember that. Always comes first, it should always come first. That's why we talk about standard procedures. It should always come first. 
because you're not going to have students do something and then engage them later. They have to be engaged from the beginning or the activity will not work. It won't work. If you don't engage the students with the topic of the reading or the content of the listening, it's not going to work. Very simple. And believe me, you're going to see this on a test. This will come up on a test time and time and time again. It's going to come up on a test. So number one. Number two is an optional step. Number two is an optional step. Pre-teaching or predicting, especially pre-teaching is optional. It depends on, on the input that you're going to use. If, it, you know, if the reading has some vocabulary that students have to... Um, yeah, so yeah, Lourdes. So it's a pre reading discussion or pre listening discussion. You can also do other activities, but you usually see a discussion, right? Especially in the textbook. If you work with a textbook, most textbooks will have a pre, it'll say pre reading discussion or discussion question. Yeah. And so that means that you're going to talk about the topic. You want to engage the topic. You want students to get interested in what you're, they're going to listen to or what they're going to read. Then you do the silent listening and the silent reading. And you almost always, if you're, again, if you're working with a textbook, again, or if you're doing it yourself, you want to ch check for comprehension. The traditional approach to checking for comprehension is uh, working with exercises, top-down, bottom-up processing. Okay, so we're going to look at that in a few minutes. Top-down. Is top-down uh, main idea or details? Which one do you think it is? Top down, main idea or details? Good Miriam, good Maria, good Lourdes. Yes, Lourdes, that's correct. Discussion is like a lead in stage, yes. Good Carmen, a reading for gist or listening for gist. Yes, meet a main idea. It is the main idea. So top down is main idea, bottom up is details. Okay. And this is important because you're going to see this not only in your classrooms, but you're going to see this on your tests. Okay. And usually the main idea comes first before the details. That's the sequence in most materials. Most DLT materials will have it in that order. And finally, you extend when you finish doing the exercises. Then what you do is you personalize, you get the students to speak or to talk to each other about the topic that they listen to, okay? I want to make this very important point. This is very, very important. I think it's very important and I can't stress it enough, okay? I cannot stress it enough. The, when you do a reading and a listening, the main, okay, we do readings and listenings for different reasons. We can do it to introduce new grammar and vocabulary in an inductive approach, yeah? So in an inductive approach, you will use grammar, excuse me, you, you use a reading or a listening uh, for, for example, you might see a, a, a conversation, A and B, A, one student does A, one student does B, and then the grammar, the vocabulary is in the conversation. So we're using it to implicitly introduce new grammar, new vocabulary, or we want just to simply get students to talk, to talk or to write. We're going to give them a, to a topic to talk about by listening or reading something and then talking about it. But the main reason we do reading and listening is for comprehension. We want them to develop their comprehension skills. Now, the textbooks will have the students do um, exercises, but to check comprehension, that's not enough. It's not enough, it will never be enough. And I will show you in the MAS CLT program what we really need to do when it comes to listening uh, for comprehension or reading for comprehension. But you must check your students' comprehension by asking them questions and multi-layered questions, not just simple comprehension questions. Huh? So you have to, for example, if, if somebody's talking about two different terms, and comparing two different terms. Then you ask them to define the terms. You ask them to compare the terms. You ask them to give examples for the terms. And then you ask them to talk about personal references in relation to the terms. 
So that's a multi-layer approach where you ask all the students in your class different questions. You have a lot of questions to check for comprehension if they really understood. Because if they only do the exercises in the book, there's really no way of knowing how many students really understood unless we check every notebook or every course book. We do a statistic. Yeah, we do a statistic. And we say, okay, 96% of my students understood. No, you, that's impossible. You can't do it, especially with big groups. So you want to ask, you want to ask the students questions. So you want to say, Liz, so tell me, Liz, what is rational thinking? Okay, Daisy, now you tell me, what is decision-making by chance? Doris, do you agree? Do you want to add something? Anneli, what do you think? Okay, now, uh, Lita, how about you compare them? What are the, the, the differences, the similarities and the differences? Okay, Sandra, what, uh, uh, what are the advantages? Okay, Erika, how, have you applied rational decision-making in your life? Okay, Rosanna, have you applied decision-making by chance in your life? So you're asking different questions and then you will really see if your students understood. That's the only way you can really know, okay? I don't care what anybody else says. I'm telling you, believe me, trust me. That's the only way you're really gonna know if your students understood. Plus, you're gonna give them a reason to use a language. You're gonna, give, you're gonna keep them on their toes so they're paying attention. And so they're gonna use a language and they're gonna be really attentive, okay? The only thing missing is you have to make sure that the reading or the listening is interesting, okay? Because if it's not interesting, it's not relevant, they're not going to listen. Okay, so strategies. There are a lot of strategies that we can teach our students. In most textbooks, thank you, Rosario. That's very motivating. Okay, very motivating. You know, speakers need to be motivated too. So students and teachers need to be motivated. Speakers need to be motivated too. Thank you for that. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so strategies. In most textbooks, you're only going to see skimming and scanning. Right? And so, I, you know, I used to ask my people, you know, the, the people used to work with me as supervisors, coordinators. Now they have other names for these positions. It's a little amusing. But so I would say, hey, what, what, what do you think? So what are the strategies that we're going to teach? And they would say, well, it's skimming and scanning. And I would say, really? That's it? Excuse me. That depends on the group because on my last group of coordinators, uh, they were different. OK, so they they got the idea. So. No, I'll do fairness. I have to be fair. So I, I said, um, because that's what we're using. It's not really anybody's fault. It's just that we're, we're conditioned to think that the only strategies that exist are skimming and scanning because the textbooks tell us that. So if, you know, in Latin America, in Latin America, we, we are, we're, we're very focused on textbook use. And so we're conditioned. So it's really nobody's fault. I mean, it's, it's just you think that's all there, all there is, but there are a lot of strategies out there that we have to teach our students progressively. Now, you're not going to teach all the strategies at once. So inferencing is very important. Inferencing is a big one. Inferencing is a very big one um, that we don't teach enough. But if, if, if your students are going to pass a higher level test, they need to know inferencing. Uh, predicting, summarizing, critiquing, questioning and guessing meaning from context. This is the biggest one that nobody teaches. Now there is, a, there is a method for teaching this particular strategy, guessing meaning from context. There is a way to teach it. It's, it's too long for me to explain here, but um, it, is, it is very, very essential. Let me tell you something. The research shows that guessing meaning from context is the most effective way to learn new vocabulary. This is the research. And this is people like Dr. Paul Nation. There's people like Dr. Rod Ellis. There's people like uh, Dr. Michael McCarthy, et cetera. Dr. Norbert Schmidt. All of these people have done research and it seems to indicate, and Dr. Neil Anderson, by the way, it seems to be that uh, Guessing meaning from context is the most effective strategy, especially for reading, starting at the intermediate level. You can teach it at the high, high basic or the, or the, or the pre-intermediate. You can teach it there too. But when students start engaging in extensive reading, 
This is the strategy that will teach them to learn on their own and to build up their vocabulary. So we have to teach our students all of these strategies. We teach them one by one, but at one point when, every, when they've learned all of them, we want them to integrate their strategies. We want them to use more than one strategy at the same time in the same lesson, okay? This is very important. This is what the research says. And the research from very important people, very smart people that I've had the pleasure of meeting personally and bringing them to Peru. I brought all of these people to Peru. So uh, thank you, Danny. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marcos. Oh, Marcos, there's Marcos. That's another wonderful name, Marcos Waripata. Nice to see you, Marcos. Good, so again, strategies. Now let's look at grammar and Lexis. And I think we're getting close to the class. We're gonna watch a video. Grammar and, class, uh, and Lexus here, just very quickly, give me, let's do, let's do about two minutes. What are the steps in teaching grammar? And I'm giving you five here. What are the steps that we now use compared to the way we used to do it in the past for teaching grammar? Give me some steps and give me some numbers. Thank you, Rosa. Oh my goodness, look at that. That is wonderful, wonderful people. I think we're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell Mariela to schedule one every day. I need motivation every day. It's been a lot of stress during the week. So anyway, thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, Cesar, thank you so much, Cesar. So guys, how about you give me some of the steps for grammar? And this is, let me do, let me say this again. This is very important because um, the standard procedure for teaching grammar and Lexis is not only important to make sure that you're teaching your classes effectively, but it's also important because it will appear on your ministry tests and it will appear on a grammar, excuse me, will appear on an international teaching test like the TKT. So this is gonna come up, okay? Use authentic examples, good Rosanna, authentic. Thank you for you saying that because when we're teaching grammar and vocabulary, we have to use authentic examples because please let me say this in the best and nicest way grammar is only useful if you if our students can use it for communication in order to do that we need authentic personalized one of you said personalized rosanna personalized examples so if you're only using examples from the book is no good Let's take a look. So we have the input. In the modern approach, we have an inductive stage, inductive stage, which means that we have an indirect approach. We don't tell the students they're going to, we know we're teaching them grammar. We want them to look at the input. If it's a reading, if it's a conversation, if it's a video, whatever it is, they're going to find the grammar or the vocabulary. They're going to listen to it. Hopefully they will notice it. They're going to analyze it. And hopefully they will notice it. So reading or analyzing the video or the, the audio. And then we go to 3P because here we're going to clarify. Here they're going to analyze. They're going to hear. They're going to be exposed to the new language, grammar and Lexis. Then they're going to analyze it. They're going to work together in pairs, maybe in groups. They're going to analyze it. They're going to speculate. They're going to tell the teacher what they think. The teacher can write some questions to guide the students. And then the teacher will clarify and do a 3P. Okay, so the outcome is being able to understand how it works, the grammar and the vocabulary, but also being able to use it. Okay, that's grammar. Let's look at a speaking lesson sequence. Okay, these are all mixed up. Please put them in the right order. I'll give you a minute and a half, 90 seconds. Please put them in the right order. And uh, this is from one of our Caprica courses. There's a lot of things in Caprica. If you participate in the MAS CLT program, you're gonna, we, we're gonna be doing, working on the uh, ministry exams and we're gonna be working on TKT and some other stuff, but we're also going to, uh, you're also gonna uh, take some international courses. This is from one of the international courses. So please take a look at it and, and um, try to put them in the right order. You have the speaking lesson sequence. Now we saw the other sequences. How about a speaking lesson sequence? What do you think? Okay, Miriam took the first step. Miriam. Miriam says E is first.
Okay. Now, please, please put them in order. So put the number if you can. Good, Elizabeth, that's the right idea. 1E. Thank you, Sadi, as always. Thank you. We have a webinar coming up soon, okay, Sadi? So I look forward to seeing you there. A Mass CLT webinar. Good, okay, Juan. Juan is starting. He says one is E, two is B. Good job, Juan. Wait, wait, somebody was, what happened back there? Who's that? Colibri Alegre. All right, she's got all the numbers right there. Look at that. Okay. Thank you, Marisa. X, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, excellent. Okay. I made my day. Okay, 30 seconds. I think we can do it 30 seconds. Okay. 30 seconds. All right, let's go. There we go. Introduction of the topic or the function, right? So again, this is the lead in, not a warm up. Now, warm up and lead ins are, you know, commonly mixed up. They're used interchangeably, but this is more of a lead in. Lead in is when you move from one activity to the next. You're using a lead in. Pre teaching is optional, depends on the level of the language, depends on what you need. Give instructions. Yeah. I should have put the letters. Yeah, I'm sorry. There should be letters. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, giving instructions, modeling, doing comprehension checks. You don't always need the three steps because if the students have done this type of activity before, you don't need to give instructions and do the modeling and do the comprehension checks uh, if, the, if, they're, if they're familiar with the activity type. Then the students work on the activity in the task. Teacher circulates, gives feedback, corrective feedback, possibly. And then reporting, summarizing, and student feedback at the end. So the students will report. So you'll say something like, Odiel, um, can you tell us what did your group talk about? How did they vote? Uh, maybe they had a vote, you know, who is the most controversial Peruvian celebrity? You know, is it uh, Susi Diaz? Is it uh, Gisela Valcarcel? Is it um, whatever, all these people, right? Um, I forgot the name of the philosopher. Uh, Brad Pizza, you know, who's the most controversial? What was the vote in your group? So she reports to us. Michelle, you say, Michelle, uh, can you summarize what you saw or what you talked about in the group? So you want them to summarize and wrap up the activity. Okay, let's go over here and we're going to look at, uh, this is also from TKT, classroom activities. And I would like you to, let's take a look here. I would like you to match the speaking practice with the activity type, okay? Match the speaking practice with the activity type. So is the focus on pronunciation? If the focus is on pronunciation, then the letter is A. If the focus is on accuracy practice, the letter is B. If the focus is on fluency practice, it's C. Let's do 68 together. So this is the classroom activity. And let me tell you something, it's very, very important, very, very important when you're taking a test, especially when you're taking a test, that you know the aim. The aim is very important. The aim of an activity is very, very important. So we had to imagine that we were going to be on an island and decide in groups what 10 things to take with us from a list of items. So this is a common activity. We've seen this before. We all of us have seen this in the textbook that we've used. Here is the focus on pronunciation, accuracy, or fluency. Michael, Michael, Michael is, thank you, Sadi. Thank you very much, Sadi. Thank you, Lizzie. Thank you. I can't see, I need my glasses. See, I, I gotta use my glasses. I can't see the name now. I can see Lizzie, but I can't see the rest of it. But anyway, thank you, Lizzie, very motivating. So yes, yeah, C is fluency because there's no reference to uh, grammar. There's no reference to uh, making sounds or intonation. So always look for keywords. Look at 69. I wanna get to the, let's see, 815. So I got about half an hour left. So, okay, so let's do 
two more together and then we'll we'll skip the rest because i want to get to the class if we do the class we do the class we do the class yeah we'll do the class okay so my partner gave me the infinitives of different irregular verbs and i had to spell the past participle i got a point for everything i got right so look at this look at look, analyze the language here so as you're trying to guess what this is automatically whenever you see grammar okay if you're taking a test and you see grammar everywhere you have to suspect what the focus might be okay you're going to have to suspect what the focus might be good and here it says i got a point for everyone i got right so you're you're being rewarded for accuracy so that's b so you you have to look and remember when you're taking a test you have to think very quickly you don't have that much time on average you have about 30 to 45 seconds per question so you want to use your time very quickly you want to be think very quickly and use your time effectively to arrive at an answer let's do one more we did a transformation drill the teacher said a sentence and we had to make it into a question as fast as we could with no mistakes so if you look at the i think i'm going to do one more if we if we look at the keywords once you see this listen even if you don't read everything else and you see no mistakes it can't be fluency it might be pronunciation but the context here when you see drill transfer look at that sofia galino she's got all the numbers right there already look at that when you see transformation drill automatically that's the practice stage of a grammar lesson and so you are focusing on accuracy okay very good there we go we got the answers so i know sophia wants to get check her answers here we go okay so foundations of speaking and listening everything we do is this or this the only other thing apart from a and b is silent work time or silent student time and this is when the students are working quietly maybe they're listening to something or they're reading something or they're doing a, a you know an exercise in the book or maybe they're working with a partner uh so everything we do in class apart from the individual work on the part of the students is either a or b this begins with an s this begins with a T. So what do you think it is? So remember, this begins with an S and this begins with a T. What is A and what is, okay. So we're talking about STT versus TTT. And so in our classes, admit, in our classes, apart from individual work time when our students are alone and they're working you know, with, their with, uh, with their partners or they're reading alone or they're listening alone or if they're, doing an exercise, they're talking or we're talking. And obviously we want STT to be higher. So there are challenges. Now, all of, us, all of us want our students to speak, right? Does everybody agree? Do you want your students to speak? We want our students to speak. We don't want them to be quiet. We don't want them to be quiet uh, in our physical classrooms. Good, Rosanna. And we don't want them to be quiet in our virtual classrooms. We want them to speak. We want them to speak out loud. Okay. But there are challenges. The first challenge is this. So, what is this, very quickly? What do you think? What might this be? Why? How does, how is this related to when students do not speak? What's going on here? What do you see? 
Good Washington. Good Sandra. Good Percy. Good Blanca. Yes, Miriam. Embarrassing. Fear to make mistakes, Sophia. Very nice. Students are shy. Yes, this is the number one reason our students don't participate. They're afraid to make mistakes. Good, good Rosa. Rosa Leonor Caro, good. Elizabeth, good. Marisa, good. Anxious. Maite, fear. This is the biggest reason. It's the biggest reason. But it's very easy to correct. It's easy to correct. So, you know, students, there's a word called self-conscious, being self-conscious. Yeah. And self-conscious is when you're worried about what other people are going to think or say. And self-conscious is, is, is very, very high. Being self-conscious, the possibility is very high with adults. It can be relatively high with teenagers, but fortunately it's much lower than, than the others with children, with young learners. That means that we have to teach our young learners to lose the fear. We have to start very early. And if we teach our students to embrace the language and to enjoy the language and to learn it naturally and not to worry about mistakes, and we act that way with our students, then when they become teenagers, they won't be afraid anymore. And when they become adults, they won't be afraid anymore either or as much as they might be. Now, remember, it only takes one teacher to throw a monkey wrench into that. So all you need is one teacher to really scare you or to humiliate you, and that, that can really have a bad effect. But we shouldn't do that. We know we shouldn't. We need to uh, reassure our students and help them lose that fear. Okay. Number two reason is we want to design our lessons accordingly. This works. If we don't design the right lessons, then, let, then the students will not be able to speak. Yeah. And number three is TTT. TTT is also a big problem because we like to speak and we like to speak a lot. And, and um, you know, and when we speak, our students don't speak. So sometimes it's good for us to speak, but sometimes it isn't. So it's good for us to speak if, as a result, our students speak, and hopefully they speak more than we do. But if we speak, and it leads to more of us speaking and not our students speaking, and there's no learning, then that's a problem. So we need to work against TTT, yeah? Okay. So very quickly, I'd like you to look at the activities here and I'd like you to check to see which ones promote STT. Which ones do you think promote STT here? Take a quick look. Let's do this for a minute and a half. And let's do this for a minute and a half. And um, tell me, which ones do you, do you think promote STT? A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Which ones do you think promote STT. Okay. Yes, Miriam, TTT avoids students learning. That's right. That's right. Okay. So let's take a look. I'll give you a minute. That's okay if you don't finish. Just as long as you give me a couple, that's okay. Okay, Janela. Colibri Alegre, okay. Yeah. Okay, let me see. Let me move this. I can't see my own. Let's see. Mm hmm. Okay, let's see. Oh, look at that. It has no answers. Okay. So this is a, a definitely they're working together. They're talking a lot. They're creating a business. B, they're only taking notes. So B is no. C, 
No, because they're only saying A, B, C, D, E, F, G, whatever the answer is. So B and C is no, A is yes, D is yes, E is yes, because if you do this often in your class, you're calling on different students all the time to report, everybody's participating. Uh, F, the teacher has a student say we're after noticing a mistake. No, because this is corrective feedback. This is error correction. So it's good for the student if you provide uh, feedback, but it doesn't really promote STT. And then G, the teacher has read aloud, has students read aloud. No, G is not reading aloud. I have a whole thing with reading aloud. I need another talk for reading aloud. I'm not going to talk about reading aloud because I'm going to spend here the whole night and I can't, I don't have the whole night. So, okay. So before we move to the class, I think we're about to get to the class. And if not, I'm going to jump right to the class. Everything we do in class is this or this. Okay. Remember that everything we do in the classroom is oriented towards form focus instruction or meaning focus instruction. At any moment in class, we are doing this or this. Very rarely are we doing both. There's only one, one situation where we do both at the same time. But I'm not going to talk about that because, again, I'd be here all night. And I know you guys, uh, I mean, you have to be careful with me because if you're not careful with me, you know, I get, I get so into these talks that I, 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 I can stay here all night. And. I have to take a flight tomorrow, so um, I can't do that. So <laughs> anyway, okay, I don't think we have time for this, but the important thing is that there are certain activity types that are more form focused, and there are certain activity types that are more meaning focused, and some of them are both, okay? And this is very important to know, especially if, you are worried about corrective feedback, when you're gonna do corrective feedback. So is corrective feedback, do you think, more here, form focus instruction, FFI, or more here, meaning focus instruction? What do you think? Where do we apply? So yes, Rosemary, FFI is form focus instruction. MFI is meaning focus instruction, okay? Where do we apply corrective feedback? Here or here? Okay. Since there's a slight delay, I'm not too sure if, okay. So guys, when Janela, okay, Sveta as well. So when you're talking about corrective feedback, you're focusing on accuracy and you're usually, oops, excuse me. Okay. And you're usually working with grammar, vocabulary, read, look up and say. So accuracy is corrective feedback. Okay, so it's always going to be a form focus instruction, not meaning focus instruction. So when you're doing a listening or a reading, a pre-reading discussion, listening discussion, production or fluency activity, you do not apply corrective feedback, except in one case, which I'm not going to explain. But usually the general rule of thumb is no corrective feedback. Yes, corrective feedback. Okay, that's the idea. That's the rule of thumb. Now, if you take a course, a Caprica course inside the Mass ELT program, you're going to learn all about corrective feedback. Okay, so this is important before we watch the video. What is the difference between an aim and a function? So the aim is the purpose, and the function is what we're teaching our students how to communicate. Okay? Yes, Miley. So good. Thank you for asking. Sometimes the writing is free writing. So we want our students to write uh, um, let's say, uh, you know, they don't have to worry. We tell them free writing by definition, they don't have to worry about grammar or pronunciation, or excuse me, or, or, uh, punctuation. They just write all their ideas and they're writing. But sometimes the writing is focused on the past tense and we want the students to practice the past tense. So they're going to write a story about something that happened to them in the past. And so there that we're going to be focusing a little more on, on accuracy. And that's when we need to give them corrective feedback. So it depends. And the same thing applies to speaking. Sometimes the speaking is 
is related to a specific grammatical form. So we, we are more focused on accuracy, but sometimes the speaking is free and open. And so we don't apply uh, corrective feedback in that case. Okay, good. Said ho. Okay, good, Luisa Gladys. Okay, yes, free writing, good. So this is very important because this is vital to any, I don't know why this is, okay. This is vital to any test that you're gonna take on teaching. The aim is important. What is the purpose of this teaching decision? What is the purpose of the activity? Okay. I think we don't have time for the video. Yeah, I don't think we have time for the video. Sorry, guys, for next time. Or if you join the Mass CLT program, we'll, we cover a lot of videos in the Mass CLT program. So we had a webinar last week and we covered four videos in one webinar. So four classes. So unfortunately, I have a time limit. So I have to make sure I get to the end. So very, very important that we recognize the aim of a lesson. The aim of a lesson, the aim of an activity, and the aim of the teaching steps. I cannot stress that enough, guys. I cannot stress that enough. It is vital for the success of your teaching. And especially if you're taking a test, whether it be for the ministry or whether it be a TKT or some other international test, you need to understand the notion of aims. Okay, what is the objective? What is the purpose of this activity? What is the purpose of this teaching decision? What are we trying to achieve or what should our students achieve? This is very, very important not only for your teaching, but also for your tests. Okay. Okay, so yeah, we were gonna do this, but I'm gonna skip it. So I think, yeah, well, okay, very quickly. If you want to, um, yeah, I'm supposed to finish in about 10 or 15 minutes. So if you want to get your students to elaborate, there are many techniques there are a lot of communicative language, excuse me, cooperative learning techniques, classroom interaction techniques. Those are the CITs and the CLTs. And there are other techniques that you can use like uh, the 432 method or the, oh, excuse me, 432 technique or the one plus one plus one rule, which is what I invented, which is say you're gonna talk about something, you talk about the main idea, example or supporting ideas, and then a personal experience in relation to that. So if you're talking about places, you do a brainstorming of places, and then you ask your students to tell you what each place is. So this is a department store. A department store, it's called a department store. A department store is a very large store that sells items in different categories. For example, they sell women's clothing, men's clothing, appliances, um, what else do they sell? Shoes and other, other things. Um, Saga is a department store and there are many department stores in Peru. Last week, I went to a department store to buy a present for my mother. Uh, she was very, very happy because I bought her a dress. So as you can see, this is a structure, a template to get students to elaborate. And this is what you need to push your students to do, especially if you're trying to have a communicative language teaching lesson. You want the students to communicate, you want them to elaborate. So you need to give them a template to get them to elaborate and to produce as much language as possible, okay? Okay, let's get to the final point here. So if you're taking a, a ministry test, you have to be familiar with the kind of content that you're gonna see. You're gonna see approaches and methods, you're gonna see teaching procedure, learning objectives and outcomes or aims. Uh, you're gonna see language forms, appropriacy of content, and it depends on the test, it depends on, this is based on one of the lessons that we use in the Mass CLT program. And the strategies, you look for clues, keywords, course level, inherent meaning, odd man out, and some others that we teach you in the, in the program. So let's take a look at this example here. This is from a ministry test. This is an example of a, of an, a widely available one. Let's do this together. Eduardo wants his students to develop their oral skills, okay? He has designed the following teaching sequence. So that means that this is first, second, third, fourth, and fifth. The students watch a video about traffic issues. So problems, right? Things that happen very often, traffic jams, bad driving, et cetera, in different cities around the world. 
Next, in pairs, the students dis discuss their impressions about the video, okay? So this is the input. Then the teacher writes the following questions on the board. What do you think about the traffic in our city? What can our authorities do to deal with traffic issues? And how can we contribute to those efforts? So traffic in our city, what can our authorities do to deal with traffic issues? How can we contribute to the authorities um, on, a, on a efforts? Next, the teacher forms groups of three and asks the students to discuss the questions and their conclusions on the flip chart. After that, the groups give an oral presentation in front of the class and answer some other questions made by the audience. Finally, the teacher asks the students to report how they organize the activity and what activities they found during the process. So you have to process this information very quickly because again, one of the biggest challenges is on any test, whether it's an English test or a methodology test is time. So being able to process the information very quickly and answering a question correctly. So you look at the actions, what are the key characteristics, right? So you have here, questions that seem a little personal because you're talking about your city and your authorities and what should we do. Then the students are asking questions and they're writing stuff on a flip chart. So they get together in groups and they're sharing ideas. And then they give a oral presentation and they, have to, and they have to ask questions from the audience. There's a lot of participation here. So this is a process, questions, discussion, output. So this is the final product. And then the teacher asks them how they organize themselves. So key tenets, odd man out. Now odd man out means that when you look at the options, sometimes two of the options are very similar and one is very different. So if they're asking you for one option, usually the one that's different is the right answer. So even if you know none of this, if you don't read any of this and you look at this, Usually, if two are very similar, then the third one that's not similar is the right answer. So, which of the following methods has not, please pay attention, not been promoted in Eduardo's teaching sequence? Task-based learning, content-based learning, or problem-based learning? A, B, or C? What do you think? Now, remember, we talked about methods and approaches, so what do you think? You obviously know what the methods and approaches are. So what do you think? So write the number and then write the letter. What do you think, guys? Oh, it froze. I see. I see that the thing froze. Hold on a second. What happened here? The image has frozen. What happened here? Are we live? Are we still live? Am I talking to myself? I think the image froze. Okay. Okay. There we go. We're back. I think the image froze, but you guys probably see it. Good, the correct answer is B. Now, if you look, if you use the odd man out strategy, A and C are very similar, task-based learning and problem-based learning. Very difficult for, you know, to make a distinction. So even if you didn't read any of this, you automatically can suspect this is the right answer, but you have to confirm it, yeah? You have to confirm it, okay. Okay. So correct. Let's look at this one. And I think I have to finish. So Manuela's students are going to give an oral presentation about global warming and its possible consequences on the planet. She asks her students to build their arguments using the following expressions. It is likely to, they won't be, they might be, they are, will definitely be. So which of the following language functions corresponds to the expressions Manuela wants her students to practice? So here you have to look at the language, okay? Language. And then you look at the options. So what language do we need for predictions? What language do we need for comparisons? What language do we need for generalizations? 
So for example, comparisons, we usually use uh, the ER at the end. So brighter, stronger, faster, et cetera, or more if it's more than two syllables. Do we see that here? Yes or no? That's a question. Predictions in the future, in a year, Peru will be very, Peru will win the World Cup. I don't know, I, I don't know. yeah, prediction. So predictions, Peru will win the World Cup. In a month, I might have a new job. Uh, so you start thinking and then you, you have to, you kind of have to remember in order to, now if you know the answer immediately, then boom, put the answer in, put, that's it. You don't have to overthink it. Because again, you're trying to focus, trying to create more time for the questions that are more difficult, yeah? But here, good, everybody's putting down A, and that is the right answer. And I think we'll do one more, one more. I hope uh, our, my friends here at English Teachers in Peru will let me do that. This is the last one. So Claudia's students have been working on living, on giving directions to places. Now she wants to take advantage of this context. Now look, They've been working on giving directions. That's the communicative function. Remember, we talked about aims and functions. This is the communicative function. Now she wants to take advantage of this context to help her students improve their speaking skills in a meaningful way. There is a key word here. Find a key word. A key word. What is the key word here? There's a word here that will magically show us what the right answer might be. It's, listen, the keyword strategy is a very powerful strategy to help us find the right answer. Very powerful because most of these tests, whether it's a ministry test, whether it's the TKT, they're designed that way. You will find a keyword. If you look for it, you will find a keyword and the keyword will make it easier to find the right answer. So what do you see here? What might be the keyword? Uh -huh. Sofia Galindo. Less. Okay, so final words here. The keyword is meaningful. And so when you see, a, a, when you're able to find a keyword and sometimes depending on the test, on the, on the different kind of tests, keywords are recurrent, they repeat themselves. And so here, for example, meaningful means relevant, it means personal, it means important, it means significant. And usually something meaningful has to be meaningful to the student, which means it's personally meaningful, it's personally relevant. So which of these three is the most excuse me, which is least appropriate. So which is the furthest away from meaningful? That's what you have to, that's what you have to think. The teacher pairs up the students and assigns them in a role. Student A is a foreigner who gets lost. And student B is a local citizen. The foreigner asks the student how to get some specific, to some specific places in town and local citizen gives them some directions. Okay, so foreigner and one student in Cajamarca. The teacher displays on the board a map of the neighborhood showing places and their locations. She writes prompts such as, how do I get to, go straight, et cetera, in pairs the students ask for and give directions to get to some of those places, okay? And C, the student gives each student a, teacher gives each student a conversation between a police officer and a tourist who's asking for directions. She tells them to practice the conversation with different classmates, changing some prepositions and places. So this is more personalized. This is more personalized. This is the least personalized. This is the most distant from meaningful. So the correct answer is C, okay? The correct answer is C because C is the least, this is here they work with a conversation. They can't change the conversation. They can't personalize. They can't process the information on their own. 
They just practice a conversation and repeat the lines and make a few little changes. This is like those textbooks that we used to work with. You know, we had that conversation in the textbook and we had to repeat the line. So I was A and you were B and we were just repeating. And then the teacher said, okay, change a word or two. And then we would change a word or two. That's not personalized. That's not meaningful. We're just repeating what is in the book. This is very similar. Okay. So to finish, uh, what is communication? Uh, so you have to remember everything we do is to get students to communicate. Everything we do is to, whether it be grammar, and remember what I said, grammar is no good if it can't get students to communicate. If it's reading and listening, we have to really check to see if they confirm, they can confirm their comprehension. And so everything, language is for communication. If I can't communicate with somebody else, I'm not learning well. So everything has to be focused on that. Second, we're in a post-methods era, which means that we no longer try to use a specific approach or method. We are now applying all the lessons that we've learned from the past, and we're adapting each experience to our students' characteristics, our students' needs, and our students' expectations, okay? We need to personalize our classes. Now, it's very easy to say personalize. Uh, I remember I worked somewhere, I can't remember where. And, uh, and so, you know, when I work there, everybody said, oh yeah, but we have small classes and we personalize. And so I said, yeah, well, what do you mean personalize? I mean, um, well, just because you have small groups, you think that's personalization? That's not personalization. So, um, so yeah, so I mean, you have to do a needs analysis. That's a very basic step. A needs analysis is a basic step. And so that's what you need to do. You need to do a needs analysis, yeah? And, and if you don't do, you have to do a needs analysis to understand what your students need and what, how you can tailor the experience to their needs. So what they like, what they enjoy, what they don't like, the activities that are their favorite activities, why they're learning English and all of these things. So that's how you personalize the teaching experience. You must uh, do a needs analysis and then every lesson, get to know your students well, every lesson adapted to their needs. Maximize participation. This is also in a virtual class, okay? It's also in a virtual class. So in a virtual class, we want to maximize participation. Everybody should participate. Leave the microphones on if they don't want the cameras on for a while, you know, a little shy, whatever, or maybe they have technical difficulties, but everybody needs to have their microphones on. As long as there's no feedback, there's no party in the background, everybody should participate. Lesson planning is still very, very important. Lesson planning is no less important than it used to be. It's still important today and it will always be very important. So in order to increase the chances of success, do your lesson planning and be very careful about it. Finally, the future, what, what do I see for the future? Here in the United States, they, um, everybody's going back to class in August. And so, but that now, at least in several states, they're gonna have a virtual school. So there are parents who are gonna wanna send their kids to virtual school. They don't have to go back to the physical school. So they're going to permanently have a virtual option or those kids who want to go to the physical school, they can go to the option. I think virtual learning is going to be here for good. I think, uh, and this I should say very importantly, the politicians have criticized virtual learning. They said that they have been saying that virtual learning was a failure last year. But remember, it's not the model. There's a lot of, a lot of factors that made it difficult to implement virtual learning successfully. And the Ministry of Education really tried hard overnight to change what, you know, what used to be teaching in a classroom to teaching online. It's not easy. Nobody was ready. The big institutes weren't ready. Nobody was ready. And so we have to understand that. And nobody trained our teachers, thousands, hundreds of thousands of teachers on how to work virtually. So once we begin to learn and adapt and evolve, we're going to realize that virtual learning also has a lot of wonderful things to offer. And so we just have to give it time. I think virtual learning is here to stay. And I'm sure that a lot of you are looking back to going back to your classes and being with your students. And I'm sure uh, I would too. And so thank you for coming today. I hope that 
Today's session was very helpful. It was a great pleasure being with you today. I was very happy to see Jessica and Lovi and Gless and uh, Betty and Yeri Luz, Isabel, of course, and, and Mar and all, all the guys, uh, Marcos and, and David and uh, Saldho. Very good, Sandra. Thank you. It was all great to have you here. Wonderful, to be honest. And uh, well, I'll see you sometime again in the future. So thank you so much. I think we have a question section. We're going to have a question section. But at this particular point in time, I'd like to thank you very much for participating. And I'd like to thank my friends at English Teachers in Peru for uh, the participation. Oh, that's right. One last thing. Um, sorry about that. One, Just one last thing, if I may. Um, just going back very quickly. Can I go back, uh, Mariela? Yes, yes, of course. Let me just go back and uh, yeah, see, I get, I get all emotional and mm -hmm. sentimental and then I, I get sentimental and then I forget to say what I need to say. So let's see, share screen, continue. Yeah, very quickly, 60 seconds. Uh, New York City Learning Solutions offers ELT professional options. Uh, we offer courses for teachers and coordinators. We offer English lang language learning platforms, international exams, and well, advising for institutions is not that relevant here. But more importantly, we offer the MAS ELT program, which is international. It offers triple certification with Caprica education courses, which are now backed by the New York, excuse me, by the City University of New York. Um, and uh, we also offer modules that prepare you for your exams with the ministry if you're trying to become a teacher and work for the public service we do offer support in being able to prepare yourself for the examinations for nombramiento and also for ascenso the nombramiento ones are coming up and then also the ascenso are coming a little, little later uh, we've been working with a wonderful group of teachers uh, very closely. I've been enjoying it so much working with them. And so this program is especially made for them. You get certificates from Caprica Education, you get certificates from us, a 230 uh, hour certificate. And the top 10%, if I'm not mistaken, top 10% will have access to a free uh, trainer of trainers course at the end of their participation uh, in our program. So that is also included. Uh, and so if you want more information, please contact uh, the administration at English Teachers in Peru, uh, and they'll be more than happy to uh, make the connection and uh, provide some initial information for you. So again, thank you so much to all of you, and thank you to my friends at English Teachers in Peru. As always, a pleasure and an honor to be here uh, with you. Thank you so much, Leonardo, for this amazing presentation. And I have some questions about it, about this program that is special sure. for uh, Peruvian teachers in this case. Sobre el programa, para que no quede ninguna duda, Leonardo, yo sé que tu, tu primera lengua es el inglés y la segunda el español, pero quisiera que no queden dudas porque ya están consultándonos eh, sobre ello. El programa es exclusivamente para eh, enseñanza de la metodología del inglés, ¿verdad? Hay un grupo en nuestra comunidad, comentarles que ya está siguiendo el programa Más ELT, Eh, que incluye webinars, ¿verdad? Eh, Leonardo, son dirigidos por ti. Así es. Eh, yo ofrezco webinars que se concentran en lo que están estudiando a través de los cursos internacionales online, pero hay un bastante énfasis también, énfasis en repasar los temas, en las competencias, los conocimientos que necesitan para poder mejorar significativamente su posibilidad de tener éxito en los exámenes de tanto de nombramiento como también de ascenso del Ministerio de Educación. Entonces trabajamos mucho esos temas, trabajamos no solamente lo que son los contenidos, sino particularmente las estrategias, cómo aplicar todo lo que es eh, de la experticia, de los conocimientos metodológicos para poder analizar cada pregunta, cada tipo de cada categoría de pregunta y cómo maximizar la posibilidad de aplicar estrategias para poder encontrar las respuestas correctas. Vimos una pequeña muestra hoy día, pero sí se trabaja mucho en eso y felizmente tenemos un grupo que, que está muy contento, que está justo avanzando, está avanzando bastante bien en el, en el programa que estamos llevando hasta el momento. Sí, más bien agradecida por ello, porque muchos de ellos son miembros de la comunidad 
que ya en el webinar pasado habían solicitado que por favor tratemos de gestionar en tu persona de repente algún programa para poderlos capacitar viendo toda la experticia que tienes. Muchísimas gracias más bien por todas las facilidades también a ustedes. que se les da a los, a los docentes que están muy contentos con este programa. Eh, gracias una vez más, Leonardo. Tenemos ahora sí unas cuantas preguntitas. Claro que eh, sí, por supuesto. Yeah, we already have a few questions, please. Uh, today is Angela. Yeah, Angela, can you read the questions for Mr. Uh, Mercado, please? Yeah, hello. Hello, hello. Hello, Angela. Hello. hello. Uh, first of all, thanks again for everything that you taught us today. And well, I can say that I was like sticked to the presentation that like every second Thank I you. really enjoy it and I think everyone did too and well uh the question that I have here well there are not a lot of questions but the question that they have is that is if there is a book that you can maybe uh recommend us to practice or to learn a little bit more or a lot more it depends on what the focus is. So, for example, if you want to focus on technology for the classroom, whether it be in a physical classroom or whether it be virtual learning, there's an excellent book called Technology for the Language Classroom, Creating the 21st Century Experience. It's written by some guy. I think his name is Leo Mercado. And, uh, and so it's, it's, um, it's available through Macmillan Palgrave. Now, it's published in, in England, in London. I don't know if Macmillan, I think Macmillan Peru has it. I'm, I'm not too sure. I think they offer it uh, or you can get it uh, through Amazon and a number of other of the online stores. But that's, that's, a, that's a very complete book. It's the latest book that I wrote uh, related to technology. Now that's if your focus is on technology, but I would recommend as a first step. Now, for example, in the Mas CLT program, we provide a lot of lectures, a lot of readings from very famous people. I think, there are a lot of wonderful experts in the field. Uh, th that's a good starting point where you can find articles online on Google. So you have people like Dr. Paul Nation. Dr. Paul Nation specializes in vocabulary acquisition. Uh, he, he specializes in uh, a, a lot of, um, uh, for example, the model for meaning focused input and, and uh, learning in class, how to teach in class using a four strand model. We have Dr. Michael McCarthy, who, who uh, is a corpus linguist. He's very famous for his different series. Dr. David Noonan, Dr. Rod Ellis. Sometimes all you have to do is type the name and you will see some articles that are free. Uh, so that's a good place to begin. But if you want to look for a book, it depends on your focus. For example, there is a book, uh, there's an area that a lot of people don't write about, which is assessment. And assessment is so, so important. Uh, now, in my books, I usually include a section on assessment, the chapter on assessment, because I think it's very important. And a lot of people don't talk about it. There is a famous author. His name is H.D. Brown. And H.D. Brown, I think those books are available in Lima. I don't know about the provinces. I think they are in Trujillo, Arequipa, Cusco. Uh, I'm not sure about Iquitos. Um, but as many of the provinces, because of the book publishers have a distributor. And so he has written about language assessment. So if you want to find a book on language assessment, uh, think about the author H.D. Brown. There's also J.D. Brown, but J.D. Brown focuses more on assessment from a research perspective. He's from the University of Hawaii, and his books are a little harder to find because it's more focused on research. If you want to focus on methodology, there aren't that many books. I would recommend Jim Scrivener's book, uh, Learning Teaching. I think it's the fifth edition now. I'm not too sure. I work, no, excuse me, not the fifth. It's not the fifth. It's the third edition. So the third edition is the blue book. And he's an excellent methodologist. I know him personally. I've been to his trainings. Uh, he's excellent. Jim Scrivener is fantastic. And of course, there's a, another methodologist. There are two methodologists, other famous methodologists. Penny Err, uh, who's very, her book was, uh, the last book that she wrote was uh, back in 97. But it's still very, very good. It's still very, very current. It has great ideas. And of course, Jeremy Harmer. Jeremy Harmer has the practice of English language teaching. I don't know if he's written the sixth edition. I, I think he stopped at the fifth. He might have the sixth edition. Um, we work with, uh, you know, we've worked with that book before when I worked was at when I was at Ipna and when I was at uh, Euridiomas, we worked with that book. But we also work with Jim Scrivener's book. 
So before I left Ibna, I introduced Jim Scribner's book. And before I left Eur Idiomas, I, I used Jim Scribner's book. And so um, that's, those are the two methods. If you want teaching, teaching, just strictly teaching methodology, it would be maybe Scribner and, uh, and Jeremy Harmon. Okay, thank you so much. I have like many books to look for. <laughs> and <laughs> I have another question um, about like uh, methods of teaching. Which is the one that you enjoy the most? I, I've always considered myself to be eclectic. So I've, I've been saying this for more than 20 years. And so I, when I was working at Ibn and I was still, well, excuse me, I was a little younger and people would ask me, well, what do you think about the communicative approach? And everybody would say, well, we do the communicative approach. We do the communicative approach. We do the communicative approach. I would say, well, I'm a little more eclectic because I think even back then, and this was when nobody really knew what the post methods era was. I think we can use, you know, ideas and principles from the different methods and approaches current ones and from the past, because in the end, we have to create an experience for each group that is ideal. But there are certain principles, and I do use my own uh, approach. It's called the 4D uh, approach, or the, excuse me, the 4D method, or the QLL dynamics framework. It has two names. So basically what that is, is it's a very easy way to teach. It makes teaching very easy. You don't have to learn methods and approaches and all that. It basically consists of four pillars. Number one, it's called the interactional dynamics. So uh, interactional dynamics means that when you're working with students, whether in a physical classroom or whether you're working online, you have to get as many students to interact in as short a period as possible. Okay, so that means you want to maximize participation. You want to get Angela to talk to Mariela, Mariela to talk to Sulamita, Sulamita to talk to Charles, Charles to talk to Sari, Sari to talk to Erika Estrada, etc as many as possible in as short a time as possible, because you, again, you, you're getting as many people to participate as, as possible. Second, L2 output dynamics means you want people to speak and to write as much as possible. So again, it's an easy framework that I've created because if you want to remember the definitions, definition number one, the teacher will do everything possible to get students to interact and move around in class if it's physical, because movement is very important. Even for adults, you have to get adults to get up and move around. So young learners, teenagers, adults, get them to move around, get them to interact, get them to interview, get them to dance, get them to jump, get them to go to the front of the front of the classroom, get them to do the role plays, get them to write on the board. Always moving because if they're sitting all the time, the brain falls asleep. The second, L2 output, get the students to speak and write as much as possible because if they don't speak and they don't write, they can't communicate. I've seen cases in the past where students were in a, in a program for a year. When I first arrived at Euridiomas, we had a complaint from a student. She said, I've been studying in your whole basic program and I can't say a word. And I said, wow, that's a big problem. We're, we have to stop that. So everything I did as a director was to change that. I said, there's no way we can allow somebody to study for a year and not be able to talk. And that happens because TTT is too high and all the teachers have too much TTT and we don't realize it students don't speak, a year passes, and they still can't speak. So they can only say good morning, good afternoon, good evening, hello, my name is, and they're in basic 10 or they're in intermediate one. So we need to get students to speak as much as possible, write as much as possible. Writing is also very important because if they don't learn how to write, especially if they want to get an FCE or they want to get something equivalent, they'll never pass the test. We have to teach them how to write. And that begins at the sentence level, paragraph level, small a small essay level and an extended or uh, essay level or extended discourse the third one would be uh, tech dynamics so tech dynamics is use technology as much as possible now in virtual classrooms we have technology everywhere so that's a good thing but when when we go back to the physical classroom we'll we'll have to go maintain the use of technology because technology saves us time and makes the class much more engaging right especially if we have games like a hoot and all these other things makes it a lot more interesting. Uh, and so um, there are a lot of different factors that we can use to get our students to really learn. So it's a simple framework, really. It's a simple framework. It's, and it's also motivational dynamics. I forgot the fourth one. Motivational dynamics means the teacher will do everything possible to maximize student uh, engagement. And that means the input has to be the right level and the input has to be relevant and meaningful. You see, we saw a word meaningful in the test that comes up in all the tests, meaningful. How do you make a lesson meaningful? 
If the lesson is not meaningful, if the lesson is not relevant, the students will not engage. If the students are not engaged, they lose interest, they disconnect, and your class is a failure. So motivational dynamics, find the right input, be charismatic, be alive, dynamic, move around. Now you don't have to be a, a dance specialist, but you have to be alive. You have to, you know, the students have to see that you're interested. So um, I would say those are the four dynamics. If you remember the four, you're probably gonna Im improve your chances of having a successful lesson uh, significantly. And remember that we as teachers, we have a very hard job. We have to make our students very happy and we have to create magical moments, not once, not twice, every time we get together with our students, every single class has to be magical. And so that's what other professions don't have to do. An accountant doesn't have to worry about that. A manager doesn't have to worry about that. You know, uh, uh, an, an economist doesn't have to worry about that, but teachers have to make every single class magical. And so I think, uh, I think that would be my, my response to that question. Thank you so much. Yes, I'm totally agree with that. <laughs> yeah, I Thank have you. another question here uh, from uh, Charles Pariachi, who asks this: uh, How to create a learn a new learning experience using eclectic method? Sure. So, uh, if you're online, if you're if you're teaching virtually, the principles are the same. You still want to, so you're going to, you're going to borrow a little of all the different methods. And so you want to have a focus on accuracy, but at the right time. Now, remember during the talk, I referred to FFI and MFI. So FFI is form focus instruction. You have to balance it. So there has to be a balance between FFI and MFI in the sense that form focus instruction, there will be times when you want your students to be more accurate. Just because we're working online doesn't mean that we still cannot provide corrective feedback. We have to provide corrective feedback at the right time and in the right way. So for example, if we're using breakout rooms, if we're using breakout rooms and, and it's a form focused in, uh, activity and we hear a student make mistake, it's still the same procedure. So we're gonna say, Angela, uh, we go to the movie theater last week we go to the movie theater last week. So I'm echoing the error. And so you're gonna say, wait, why is he doing that? Why is he going, why is he saying, Angela, uh, we go, oh, wait a minute. Yeah, he's, we go last, sorry, teacher, we went. Right? So we have to provide feedback. So the eclectic approach means that in general, we want our students to communicate as much as possible. Yeah, but we use specific techniques and strategies that come from, depending on the group that we're working with, right? That's why we have to do a needs analysis. Every time we get together with a group, we have to do a needs analysis. Angela, how long have you been studying? Why do you wanna study? What do you like in your English classes? What scares you? What, what do you find difficult? What do you expect from me? So all of these questions have to come. So you combine the eclectic approach to your students' needs, but you have to get to know your students. This is what we cannot, we can never forget that. We have to get to know our students. We have to get to know Rochi, and we have to get to know Daniel, and we have to get to know Roxana, and we have to get to know uh, Gianni, and we have to get to know all of these wonderful students that we have. So I know that Johnny wants me to practice a lot of pronunciation. So I should have to make sure that when I do my lesson planning, I dedicate a few minutes to pronunciation practice. And Daniel, he likes, he likes games. He likes Kahoot or he likes uh, quizzes. Okay, let me introduce a quizzes once a week so that you know he's happy and other people like Jose Ortega and Julissa and Eliana, they like games too. By the way, one of the things that we learned, we used to do at Euridiomas, I don't know if they still do it because I'm not there anymore, but what we used to do, we used to do thousands of needs analyses every month. And so the students would come to class and then they would uh, fill out their needs analysis online, right? Or you know, by way of their cell phones or online. And that information would be channeled to a, a central source where uh, the teacher could find the information for her class or his class. And so I would know what Angela likes. I would know everything about what she expects. And so Angela and Junior and Eliana and Jose and Ellie and Betty, I know what they want. So how do I plan my lessons so that I can make everybody happy as much as possible most of the time? And so that I think is the key to the eclectic approach in a post-methods era. You wanna use the strategies and techniques 
that will maximize your students' engagement, motivation, and ability to learn. And at the same time, you want to personalize the learning experience as much as possible by getting to know your students. I think that's the balance. If you want to uh, uh, find a, a modern, successful approach to teaching and learning in the virtual era post-pandemic, I think there are a lot of basic principles that still apply, but you want to find that balance between strategy and techniques. You use what you need for that particular group and each group that you have. Yeah, make them love your class. And also, you're going to love it too. <laughs> Yeah, Angela, I think that's a great point. Make them love your class because if they love your class, you know, that when the class is over, they're going to say, oh, teacher, really, it's over, yeah. right? But if, if the class is over, yeah, yes. If they go like that, then why well, you are, whoa, wait a minute, what happened? Why are they so happy if the class is over? Yeah. So you want to make them happy. You want them, I think the, 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 the key point is that you want your students to look forward to seeing you again, to be sad that the class is over and to really want to see you again. If you can do that, then you got everything in your favor. I think your students are going to succeed and you're going to feel good. Remember that teachers have to be motivated too. And so if a teacher feels good, the teacher knows that the students love her or him and that they're looking forward to seeing, that's, that's a wonderful thing. Then you want to work, you want to, do, you want to continue doing that work. And so I think that's another really, really important factor to consider. Yes, that's right. Thank you so much again for everything for today. Thank you, Angela. That's really, really amazing. And now is uh, time for the exit ticket. So I hope you can. Okay, good. Us. All right. All right. Okay. Is teacher Kevin here? Hello. Yes, I'm here. Can you see me? Thank you so much. Can you see me? Yes. All right. Uh, okay. Um, thank you so much, Mr. Mercado, for a wonderful workshop. Thank you, Kevin. You can, you can join us and you can uh, uh, be with us just a couple of minutes more just to take of the Of course, last yeah. of course, Thank by you. all means, of course. All right. All right. Um, this is the exit ticket, your teachers. Entonces, eh, vamos a compartir el exit ticket para ustedes para que puedan eh, tenerlo. Recordemos que está habilitado 15 minutos, igual que el día de ayer, solo que en esta oportunidad tengan mucho cuidado con las letras E, T, la minúscula I, mayúscula P, y second, también en, en el vivo también se está compartiendo el exit ticket para que puedan visualizar y tener cuidado con ello también. Nuevamente, no nos olviden eh, tener mucho cuidado, por favor, si lo van a redactar desde su computador, o caso contrario, también va a estar como comentario fijado en, en el vivo. Así que, por favor, mucha atención. Eh, van a poder observar dentro de los comentarios un comentario que resalta, que es el comentario fijado para que ustedes puedan acceder rápidamente. Uh -huh. Querido Kevin, te robo sí, unos por supuesto, minutos Alicia. nada más. Gracias. Eh, estimados teachers, por favor, yo sé que todos quieren información sobre el programa que, que dirige en Mr. Mercado. Están escribiendo todos sus correos electrónicos en los comentarios. No es necesario, por favor, no los vamos a poder revisar todos. Eh, les pido, por favor, que ahora que Kevin acaba de dar el exit ticket, eh, procedan a completar ese registro de asistencia que lleva algunas preguntitas sobre el webinar de hoy. Y con toda la información que vamos a recoger de su registro, en donde van a estar sus correos electrónicos, nosotros les vamos a enviar toda la información eh, sobre, el, sobre el curso también. No necesitan, por favor, escribir sus mails. Esa es información personal de ustedes. Lo hacemos de manera regular a través del Exit Ticket. Gracias, Kevin. A usted, a usted, me dice. Yo creo que ya estamos listos para continuar. Continuamos entonces con la invitación para la próxima semana. Nos ayuda aquí Miss Diana, Miss Maite. Are you there? Yes, we are. Here. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good evening, everybody. Well, for our next webinar, our dear Miss Kay Novoa is going to teach us how to create micro videos, and you can invite all your colleagues from other areas, okay? So when? The next Friday at the time at six o'clock. Miss Mente, you can continue, please. Hello, of course, Miss Diana. Hello, everyone. Uh, hello, Mr. Mercado. 
So uh, we have a special invitation for next Saturday also. Uh, we, um, we present to wonderful Mr. Teacher uh, Michael Navarro with the topic motivation, how to bring the speak back into, you, into your classroom. So this um, webinar is uh, Saturday uh, from 6 p.m. So uh, don't miss it. Thank you, Miss Mariela. Yes, thank you girls. Para el próximo, acá tenemos a, a, a little mistake, <ríe> un pequeño error nada más en la fecha. Eh, tenemos el día viernes a Miss Catherine Novoa. Vamos a hacer la transmisión eh, desde ya con anticipación. Les comentamos mediante nuestro canal en YouTube. Así que les vamos a dar el link de conexión con anticipación porque a veces tienen problemas para conectarse. Eh, Miss Catherine Novoa, que es administradora también de nuestra comunidad, va a compartir con ustedes una herramienta digital infaltable para todo maestro de, eh, en este tiempo de pandemia, en este contexto remoto, que es Canva. Canva nos sirve para muchísimas cosas, pero vamos a verle el día viernes a las 7 de la noche para poder ver, me, elaborar micro videos usando Canva. La resolución queda espectacular, así que no se pueden perder porque realmente es una herramienta súper útil. Y con Michael Navarro, como ya lo mencionó Miss Maite, eh, tenemos un tema alineado también justamente al temario del Ministerio de Educación sobre la motivación, el andamiaje, warm-ups, How to bring the spark but into your classroom. Con Michael Navarro, que lo va a compartir con nosotros sábado 6 de la tarde. Muy bien, queridos eh, English teachers in Perú, es el momento creo ya de despedirnos, querida Angelita. Este es todo el equipo maravilloso que está detrás de toda la organización de estos eventos dirigidos con mucho cariño hacia cada uno de ustedes maestros para poder fortalecer su desarrollo profesional y que cuentan con el apoyo de excelentes seres humanos y ponentes que colaboran compartiendo sus conocimientos como el día de hoy Mr. Mercado lo ha hecho con todos nosotros y a quien le agradecemos de corazón realmente su presencia esta noche. Muchísimas gracias, estimado Leonardo. De repente ya podemos encender, querido equipo, todas las camaritas para podernos despedir de toda nuestra comunidad. Miss Maite, Miss Dianita, Kevin... Encendemos las camaritas, dejamos de compartir, Angelita. Ya está, ahora sí nos podemos ver. Miss Catherine, Miss Pame, listo, ahora sí estamos. Bien, Leonardo, cerramos entonces con broche de oro el webinar eh, de hoy. Una vez más, muchísimas gracias, estimado Leonardo. Vamos a estar en contacto contigo de todas maneras para toda la información de repente que se requiere adicional y van a solicitar seguramente los maestros sobre este programa más CLT dirigido a todos los docentes. Muchas gracias una vez más a nombre de toda la comunidad English Teachers in Peru. Muchas gracias. Listo, nos despedimos entonces, Miss Sulamita Chutén, Miss Maite Flores Plaza, Miss Ángela Salazar Barreda, Miss Diana Carla, Teacher Kevin Mario Laura de la Cruz, Miss Pamela Salazar, Teacher José Ortega, que siempre está detrás de la transmisión. A todos, que tengan muy buenas noches. Bye, bye.